So greetings to all of you. I want to welcome all of us at Center Street Church. I must confess, I love seeing your face when I preach. Without a live audience and the affirmation that you give, I feel a bit lonely. Now, how do you preach passionately before a camera? However, I'm trusting that there are hundreds of you watching this message and God is eager to communicate to us through his inspired word. That's what offers me the motivation and passion because in trying times like these, there is a genuine hunger to hear a message from God. And my job is to be a mouthpiece for Jesus. That's the reason I take uh, this aspect of my calling very seriously. I'm grateful for technology that we can worship together as a church family and we can minister to you wherever you are in this digital age. If you watched our worship services last weekend, I preached to you about the good shepherd who holds us securely in his hands. No matter what our circumstances may look like, we are okay. We are safe and secure in the promise of Jesus. And the coronavirus cannot extinguish the life that we have received from Christ. Today, I want to continue on the same theme as we find comfort in the imagery of God that Christians over the centuries have turned to in times of distress. Now, I've been reflecting on this the last few days. Our lives have been totally and unexpectedly disrupted in a very short period of time. I looked at my calendar that was uh, once full of activities and it was actually sobering. I had made meticulous plans for the months ahead all the way leading up to the end of summer. And I had a game plan for my ministry area, tons of meetings. There were some important ministry trips planned, a much needed family vacation, a speaking assignments, a plan to pursue my further education. And now there is a question mark over pretty much everything. My life has been interrupted. My plans have been derailed. And if I don't have the right perspective, this can be extremely frustrating. Now, I bet you can identify with me because it's not just my life that has been interrupted, but it's your life and the lives of countless people in our globe today have been interrupted as well. This is universally true. It is unanimous, doesn't really matter where you live. We all are struggling with this disruption. Our life has been turned upside down. Your plans have gone off course in ways you never anticipated. How do we cope with this disruption? That's the big question. How do we maintain the right perspective in the midst of all that's happening around us? It is by trusting in the goodness of the shepherd who leads us from the front. We're going to look at John chapter 10, verses 10 to 18. Where are you watching this? I'm going to ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's word. So let's read this together. John chapter 10, verses 10 to 18. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life 
for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, in a time such as this, when there's absolute pandemonium all around us, our hearts long to hear a fresh word from you. The message of comfort and reassurance and hope that only you can bring in the midst of all the chaos. So we quieten our hearts now and we open ourselves, Lord, to the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Come and speak to us. Take away our fears and anxieties and give us the right perspective so that our hearts will be truly encouraged to be ambassadors of your good news. So we give this time into your hands. We ask this in the powerful and matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. If we were to pick an animal that best describes us, we have a lot to choose from. There is the majestic looking tiger with its burning eyes. Then there's the lion that is a symbol of strength and vigor. We have the eagle that soars high in the blue sky. Then there's the persistent, hard-working beaver. Now, who in the world would ever say the animal that best describes me is a sheep? Mild and timid by nature, sheep are some of the least intelligent creatures. Yet when God refers to us, of all objects of comparison, he likens us to a flock of sheep. It is a dominant image in the Bible. A sheep are not resilient, self-sufficient, autonomous creatures. In fact, their very survival hinges on the shepherd. Without a shepherd, they are toast. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 says this about Jesus. When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's a disaster for a sheep not to have a shepherd. For they are unable to feed on their own or nourish themselves. They certainly cannot protect themselves from the predators that are lurking all around them. They need a shepherd in order to even survive. So Jesus saw the crowds during his time, and they had no spiritual leader. They were without an anchor. They were rudderless, and Jesus had compassion on them. And that word compassion in the original language communicates strong emotions. It's like Jesus' stomach was churning inside. He was totally gutted. He felt deeply for the people of his time who were lost without a shepherd. They were harassed and beaten down, helpless and confused. And I tell you, that is a fitting description of the people who are living in our world today. Amidst a serious COVID-19 crisis, Jesus looks at people who are outside of his family. And his heart is flooded with compassion as they struggle to navigate through life. Fear of illness, loss of work stock market tanking, uncertainty about the future, 
All this is having a devastating effect on people. And that's why the world needs Jesus today. They desperately need the leadership of the good shepherd. The sheep outside of the fold need to come in and find the refuge and the safety that the shepherd brings. For we are not smart enough, brave enough, resourceful enough to go through this challenge, this pandemic in our own strength. The good news is there is a shepherd par excellence who's eager to offer you the security of being in his care. Now let's go back to our text in John chapter 10 and we will find out what difference the good shepherd can make in our life. Why we should follow his leading and the difference Jesus makes in a time such as this. Look at verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You can see here there is a contrast being drawn between the thief and Jesus. The thief comes with one objective of stealing the sheep. His motives are sinister. The sheep are stolen so they can be slaughtered. And that's why the emphasis is on the word destroy. That is the end outcome of what happens when the the sheep encounters a thief. The thief here in the immediate context of John chapter 10 may be a reference to the religious leaders with their false teachings. However, from the larger context of the Bible, you can say that the thief is a metaphor for Satan who exists to oppose the work of God. Satan, as the enemy of God, attacks the people of God with the intent of bringing destruction. But in total contrast, we see Jesus as the one who gives life. Jesus is the life giver. For we were dead in our sins. But that moment when we placed our faith in Christ, we received spiritual life. We are born from above. Now, Earlier in John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me, will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus is using another another analogy from his time of uh, when how they raised a sheep. The sheep pens, which were a safe resting place for the sheep during the night, were made with only one entrance. The door for these uh, sheep pens was the shepherd himself. He laid his own body across the entrance so the sheep can go in and they can go out. And that also kept the wolves away from the flock. So the shepherd himself was the door. So in the same way Jesus is saying, there is only one entry point, one passage of access. It is Christ himself. He is the door that leads to life. As you walk through this door, you enter into green pastures and quiet waters. Jesus doesn't offer us a bare minimum existence, but Jesus offers fullness of life. The Greek word for full means abundance. Something that is superior, extraordinary, surpassing, uncommon. That's the kind of life we have now in Christ. The abundant life is above all a life of total contentment. It is a life of deep abiding satisfaction. And take note of this. This is not something relegated to the future, something we will experience once we get to heaven. But this is our 
current possession. That is the emphasis in John's gospel. We have eternal life now. Even death cannot destroy it. So let's not allow the pandemic surrounding the coronavirus to rob you of the gift of abundant life that we have in Christ. Are we living in challenging times? Absolutely. Have we seen anything like this crisis? No. But here is the good news. Our circumstances do not negate the promises of God. If you come to Jesus who is the gateway of life, that very moment you inherit the gift of eternal life. You're made alive. You're brought under his providential care. And this is a life that overflows with joy and peace and satisfaction. The world around us may crouch in fear and anxiety because they are like sheep without a shepherd. They are worried and hassled as to who's going to take care of them, how are they going to survive. However, for those of us who have Christ as our shepherd, we don't need to be anxious. Instead, we can demonstrate a depth of peace in the midst of the storm. The storm may be raging on the outside, but deep in our hearts, we have peace that comes from Jesus. What a witness that is to the watching world. A former pastor of Moody Church in Chicago used to say, the flavor of a tea bag comes out best when you put it in hot water. That is true of our Christian faith. When life gets hard, in testing times, in times of unrest and confusion, what is inside of us seeps out and the world takes notice of it. If you have the good shepherd, you also have the gift of life. That is his promise to you. Look at what else our text says about the good shepherd. Verse 11, Jesus declares here, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A good shepherd is entrusted with the safety of the flock. He constantly risks his life for the well-being of a sheep. The sheep out in the open face all kinds of threats and dangers. But a good shepherd puts his life on the line in order to protect the flock. The pack of wolves will have to go through the shepherd first before they can get to the sheep. You know, in total contrast, the hired hand flees because he is not the owner of the sheep. He is in this for money, just doing a job. His motives are selfish. And at the very first sight of trouble, he escapes and leaves the flock all alone. But Jesus is not like that. He is a reliable shepherd who will never forsake his sheep, even in times of trouble. Now, if you carefully read our passage, you will see four different times Jesus says he lays down his life for the sheep. This is the highest expression of love. A person's willingness to give his or her life for another. That is why across cultures we value sacrifice. A Christian apologist, Abdu Murray, puts it this way. The greatest possible ethic is love. And the greatest possible way to express that ethic is through self-sacrifice. The greatest possible ethic is love, and the greatest possible way to express that ethic 
is through self-sacrifice. You know, healthcare workers today are demonstrating this in concrete ways. As the world is reeling under the COVID-19 crisis, around the world, doctors and nurses and medical professionals are working tirelessly, endangering their own lives for the welfare and well-being of others. See, I tell you, it is our responsibility to pray for them and express our sincere gratitude for their commitment to bless others. Their contribution is huge. Sacrifice is a universally admired virtue. Pastor Brooksy Cabby writes in one of his books about the Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross is Canada's highest military honor. The medals are awarded for personal acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. Of the thousands awarded to date, there have been many cases when people in military have been given this award for falling on a grenade to save their fellow comrades. In fact, the first Victoria Cross of World War II was awarded to Sergeant Major John Robert Osborne. The Sergeant Major and his men were cut off from their battalion and were under heavy attack. When the enemy came close enough, the Canadian soldiers were subjected to a barrage of grenades. And several times, Osborne protected his men by picking up live grenades and throwing them back. But eventually, one grenade fell in a position that made it impossible to pick it up in time. And with only a split second to decide, Osborne shouted a warning and threw himself on top of the grenade. It exploded instantly, killing him. The rest of the troops survived that battle because of Osborne's sacrifice. You know, when I come across stories like this, here's what I find to be breathtaking. A soldiers who fall on grenades do so out of love for their friends while they are on a battlefield trying to kill their enemies. But when you look at the cross of Christ, we see while we were still sinners, when we were God's enemies, rebels bent on going our own way, Jesus gave his life for us. And that kind of love is in a category of its own. You cannot find a closer comparison. And there's a beautiful old chorus that goes like this. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. How do we cope with disruptions in life when our plans are derailed? It is the assurance that I am following the leading of the one who loves me, who gave his life for me. He demonstrated the greatest possible ethic in the greatest possible way. And that guarantees me that he has my best interest at heart. If you look at the cross, the cross is a cruel instrument of torture. That's where the good shepherd died to rescue us from the grip of sin, to release us from the oppression of the enemy. And this is God's master stroke. 
For he takes a cruel instrument of torture and death and transforms it into an instrument of life. And that is why when bad things happen, I don't question God's love or doubt his motives because he has already demonstrated his utmost love for me and for this world. No further proof is needed. Let me remind us, we are now in the season of Lent in the church calendar. It is a solemn season that leads to Good Friday, the day Jesus died on the cross. Lent is often associated with giving up something. You know, with all that has happened in the last couple of weeks, someone said, I wasn't expecting to give this much up for Lent. You know, it is ironical but it has been forced on us. We've given up sports. We've given up going to the mall. We've given up eating at restaurants. We've given up travel. We've given up going to movie theaters. This is the most any of us would ever give up for Lent in your lifetime. You know, humor aside, this is a great opportunity and time when life is a little bit quieter, to reflect on the cross. The cross is the ultimate symbol of brokenness. Jesus embodied on the cross all of the brokenness and suffering of the world. He took it upon himself. A Dr. Timothy Tennant, who is the president of Asbury Theological Seminary gave an address to the students of the seminary during this current pandemic. And I heard him say this, so I'll give him credit for this thought. We hear the word coronavirus about 100 times a day, perhaps more. Do you know what the word corona means? It means a crown it has its root. In Latin, so corona means crown. The virus is called corona because under extreme magnification, it actually looks like a thorny crown. Therefore, it is quite literally the thorny crown virus. I find this fascinating. When you read the gospel accounts of the events that led to Jesus' crucifixion, you will see Jesus was given a crown of thorns. The Roman soldiers mockingly gave Jesus a thorny crown because of the accusation that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. So the thorny corona that was placed on Jesus' head was symbolic. It signified that Jesus was willing to endure pain, insult, and shame on our account. Jesus embraced our brokenness. And while our world is obsessed with this tawny crown virus, During the season of Lent, let us as Christians be obsessed with our Savior who bore a crown of thorns in order to give us eternal life. And in this global coronavirus pandemic, the one who bore the crown of thorns is not distant and watching this from afar. Rather, he suffers with us. The cross of Jesus proves that when it comes to pain and suffering, God is no stoic. In fact, when you study other world religions, it will come clearly. 
they find a way of minimizing the reality of pain. Worldviews and other religions woefully are inadequate when it comes to the theology of suffering. Christianity is the only religion that worships a God who suffers. So I tell you, it is safe to entrust your life in the hands of the one who bore a crown of thorns for you. The one who demonstrated the highest possible love on the cross. You know, there's something else that the Good Shepherd says in our text that is simply mind-blowing. This is why I can fully rely on him, even if I feel everything in my life is disrupted. I look at verses 17 and 18 of our text. Jesus says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. You know, I talked to you about the universal virtue of sacrifice. That how people give their lives for the good of others. And that is outstanding. But while they may lay down their life, they don't have the authority to take it back. That is outside of their prerogative. Once you're dead, you're dead. You cannot undo it. A person who can lay their life down and take it back again is in a class of their own. Human beings don't have that power. Only God has. And Jesus reveals here in our text the authority that he has. Our good shepherd is God himself. The religious leaders did not plot Jesus' death. The Roman soldiers did not kill him. No one has the power to take his life. At the appointed time, Jesus voluntarily gave his life away. And as the triumphant son of God, he also has the authority to take his life back. So after his death, three days later, Jesus gloriously rose from the dead to declare that he has all authority and lordship over this universe. The outbreak of the coronavirus has led to the loss of many lives. Death is all around us. The numbers are staggering. But think about this. The coronavirus doesn't increase the percentage of death. The world's death rate is holding steady at 100%. But what the coronavirus does do is bring to the surface, bring to light of the inevitable happening to us, the possibility of an event like that taking place. And that's what causes such great fear. But for a follower of Jesus Christ, this is our blessed assurance. When a Christian dies, it's not because he or she has been forsaken or forgotten by God. But it just means that their time on earth has come to an end from God's standpoint. And he is calling them home. Church, I tell you, that conviction has served me well. I don't know when I will die, but this I do know, that no one can take my life even an hour before the appointed time God has for me. 
Consequently, the fear of death is removed and we are in turn filled with an internal confidence. And what a great comfort it is to have Jesus as our good shepherd walking with us. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is still with us. We are never alone. Jesus has conquered death. And as a result, we as Christians don't have to fear humanity's worst enemy. Now let me go back to where I started. How do we cope when plans go awry? When things don't turn out the way you hoped for? It's by getting to know the Good Shepherd. For when you know the Good Shepherd, you will find out from experience that He is reliable and trustworthy, that he is sovereign and all-powerful. More importantly, you will know that he holds your life and he has your best interests at heart. And as a sheep that belongs to Jesus, he will make a way for you to lie down in green pastures and lead you by the quiet waters. Jesus gives us the gift of life, and it is life overflowing, life abundant, life to the full. And as we come to an end, I'm going to ask us to just close your eyes wherever you are. And this is an opportunity to reflect on what you've heard from God. God has spoken unmistakably and clearly through his word. And if your heart is filled with any kind of fear, would you just open your hands, your palms right now in a posture of surrender and say, Lord, take away the fears and the anxieties or the uncertainties that are surrounding me and fill me with the blessed assurance that I am yours and you are mine. So let's maintain a moment of silence. And in the stillness of this moment, God the Holy Spirit is alive and at work in us, speaking to us and personalizing this message. And after a moment of silence, I'll close this in prayer. Lord, we look at the destruction that this coronavirus has brought about in our world and our hearts break. We look at people who are suffering and they are like sheep without a shepherd. And we pray for those people, Lord, all around the globe who are afraid, who are fearful, who are suffering in so many ways that you would reach out to them and that they will come to know that there is a good shepherd who has the power to give them life and life to the full. We pray that this current crisis will be used by you to cause a spiritual awakening, that people will be drawn to you and to the hope that we have in you, Jesus. And we pray for families that represent our church. Lord, would you give us a deep sense of peace and calm, a quiet confidence that will be so evident 
to those who are around us, that they would ask the reason for the hope that we have. And it will open up opportunities to declare your good news. So we do pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this world, that you would stretch forth your nail-pierced hands and bring healing and complete restoration. Today we, we are grateful for the confident hope that we have, that we belong to you, Jesus. And we ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Partner with us by giving to what God is doing in and through Center Street Church. Click on Give to learn more. If you are in the Calgary and area region, we invite you to visit one of our five campuses next weekend. Click on Find a Campus Near Me and come say hello. We look forward to meeting you and helping you find a place to belong, grow, and learn about God.